you've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Buck here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Our guest for this week's show is real estate investment expert and repeat offender to the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, Brian Murray. Uh, Brian acquired his first investment property in 2007. Without raising any outside capital, Brian bootstrapped his way from newbie investor to founder and CEO of Washington Street Properties, a commercial real estate investment and property management company that has been ranked on the Inc. 500 and 5000 list of the nation's fastest growing private companies for five years in a row. In 2015, Brian was recognized with a Gold Stevie Award for Executive of the Year in the real estate industry. Brian is also the author of the best-selling and award-winning book, Crushing It in Apartments and Commercial Real Estate, which sold more than 20,000 copies in its first year of publication. And I'll tell you guys, I've, I've read it. It's definitely a must read for those of you that are looking to get started in the commercial real estate space. Okay. It's, it's got a lot of great information. It's a thick book. I think it's probably 400 plus pages. So lots of good information there. Um, no fluff whatsoever. I def definitely recommend it. Uh, in addition to Brian's uh, real estate endeavors, um, Brian also has worked as a teacher, a technology executive, management consultant, and engineer. Uh, his media appearances include interviews on CNN, PBS, CBS Market Watch, and Brian has been also quoted by the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and dozens of other major newspapers around the world. He holds degrees from Syracuse University, John Hopkins University, and the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. And so there's a, a litany of topics that uh, I'm looking forward to covering with Brian uh, in, in today's show. Um, and if you haven't listened to it already, go back and listen to our first show that we did together, episode number 135. I think you'll find a lot of value in both that show as well as this current one. And so a few of the topics I'd like to, to cover today are details on how Brian repurposed an old hotel into a thriving apartment complex. That's a very unique and interesting business model we're going to dive into today. Uh, what his favorite asset type is and why. Uh, how he manages to spread his focus amongst numerous different asset types versus just focusing on one. Like, for example, uh, our business is mobile home parks. I mean, that's what we focus in. Not that I haven't owned other types, but today we focus solely on mobile home parks. Brian has a litany of different types of of uh, assets that he is involved in. Uh, we're gonna talk to Brian about how he feels about local investing versus owning and operating assets outside of his geographical investment area. Also talk to him about how he's finding great opportunities even in today's, I call them challenging times because everyone's chasing yield. People are paying you know, exorbitant prices for, for properties and Brian is still uncovering uh, great deals and, uh, and it's happening on a regular basis. Additionally, we're gonna talk about the mistakes he's long, made along the way and what lessons that he's, that he's taken away from them and, and much, much more guys. So I'm excited to have a, another candid conversation with Brian about um, just again, a variety of topics and I'm absolutely confident that you guys are gonna find huge value in this time together. And so with that, a few items I wanna cover before we get onto the show with Brian. First and foremost, if this is the first time that you're tuning into the show, I just want to welcome you to our family here at the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, or if you're one of the many millions of loyal listeners that listen to the show on a weekly or monthly basis, whatever have you, I just want to welcome you back and thank you all from the bottom of my heart for being here. I, I wouldn't be here. The show wouldn't be around if it wasn't for you. Uh, and since it's really loyal listeners like yourself that make it all possible, I'd like to take a moment and give a shout out to one very awesome person who took the time to leave a five-star rating on iTunes. And this is from Josh. Uh, it says, I have been a listener of Kevin Bupp's podcast for a while now, and they have been monumental in my journey of learning about real estate investing. He brings on industry experts and is the best, and it, it is the best free learning resource that I have found in the industry. Keep the podcast coming. Well, Josh, really appreciate that. Appreciate taking the time to go there. And guys, if you love what we're doing here, it only takes a minute. And really, these reviews drive our drive our, uh, our overall uh, growth of the podcast. It attracts guys like Brian. Brian looks on there and he sees that we got, you know, no reviews. He's going to think no one's listening. That's not the case. So it helps us attract quality guests like Brian. Take a minute, go subscribe to the show. And if you're so inclined, leave us a, um, an honest 
rating and review. And I'll be sure to give you a shout out on an upcoming episode. And just a few other items real quick before we get on here. Just want to remind you about the free 30 minute phone consultation that I just started offering again uh, after about a one year hiatus where you can basically get on the phone with me, uh, no ulterior motive whatsoever for 30 minutes and discuss anything and, and everything your heart desires about, uh, about real estate investing, whether you're brand new or you're a seasoned investor and just want to talk shop. Um, again, this is a way for me to connect with the listeners and, and, and give back in, in many different ways. This is a way for you and I to literally connect together and, and talk about your business and, and see if I can maybe give you some positive guidance on how to ultimately reach your goals. Um, how you want to schedule that call is go to kevinbup.com. Scroll down about three quarters of the way to a button that says schedule a call with Kevin. And just be sure you schedule that call. Put in notes about exactly what you like to talk about, okay? Make sure that our 30 minutes together is done uh, or spent as efficiently as possible. Um, so put some details in there about the questions or the topic you'd like to discuss. Lastly, guys, we're hiring here at Sunrise Capital Investors. If you have an interest in the different career opportunities that we have available here in the uh, Tampa Bay location, you can go to careers.sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. Uh, we've got multiple positions we're looking to fill. We'd love to join a, an awesome team here. And if you're a rock star yourself, we'd love to hear from you. Again, careers.sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome back our guest for today's show, Brian Murray. Brian, how's it going, my friend? Great. Really excited to be here, Kevin. Thanks so much for having me back. It's an honor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your day. I know you're busy. Uh, every time I talk to you, uh, I saw you, I guess, about probably six months ago to Mastermind that we're both a part of. And, um, you know, prior to that, it had been over a year since we had last chatted. And uh, you're just, you're continually growing, buying more properties, your company's growing. Uh, you've just got a lot of great things happening. So I'm excited to have you back here. I know you're busy, but you're, I'm excited to have you back to just really get an update from me as to what's been going on over the last couple of years. And, um, you know, there's, there's some specific topics I'd like to cover with you as well. But for those that haven't listened to the prior show we did together and don't know about you or maybe haven't read your book and don't know your story, maybe just take a few minutes and give us a little bit of a background of yourself and, and ultimately how you got into real estate. Yeah, sure. Glad to. Um, you know, I started real estate investing back in 2007. And uh, one of the things that was unique is, you know, without having any prior investing experience, I, I jumped right in with both feet and, and uh, purchased a 50,000 square foot office building. So that was that was the, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the short story. Um, both feet in the fire, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I was teaching at the time and um, having a little trouble making ends meet and looking for some extra cash flow. And, and I'd always been interested in real estate. So I did a, did a lot of quick education. And, um, you know, the, the, again, long story short, I ended up jumping into a really large property and tackling it and, um, spent the next couple of years turning that, that, uh, ship around. That's fantastic. So, and so that, that, that's led you up to where we're at today. So that's been, uh, what you said, 2007. So yeah, what, 12, 12 years. years that you've been yeah. at this. Okay, good deal. So yeah. you, you bought that 50,000 square foot office building. I know we went into detail uh, yep. in the last show. So guys, go listen to 135. We actually go into um, uh, detail about that, that, that acquisition, that first deal. That's a huge deal. That's a game changer for most folks, and especially if you're working a full-time job as a teacher, uh, to step into a project that large uh, as your first deal is, um, I mean, that's monumental in and of itself. So go listen to that show. We're not going to talk about that too much here today because I don't want to be redundant. And so what, what I love to, what I love to, I guess, talk to you about first, Brian, is maybe you'll just get a general update as to, um, you know, if there's been any major changes in your business, maybe the direction that you're taking your company from when we spoke last time to today, you know, again, we're in a, we're in a multifamily mastermind together. I know that you've always been in the multifamily space uh, and you've owned other types of uh, uh, real estate as well. Um, but I'm wondering now if, are you starting to put more emphasis on one asset over another, but so maybe give us a little bit of an update yeah. as to you know, what's been going on over the last couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that, and that, that first acquisition kind of set the tone in terms of um, how I, you know, developed my, my company and it's really based on value add. So it was an easy transition from commercial into multifamily and, and, we, and we grew in both sides. And, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, my portfolio was about 50-50, uh, commercial being uh, office and retail primarily and, and about 50% multifamily. And over the last couple of years, since I was on your show last, we've really started to focus more on the multifamily side. Mm. We're probably, I'd say at this point, 65 to 70% of our portfolio is in multifamily. 
Um, and some of the challenges for us that we faced is, yeah, I, I, I grew our entire portfolio all within close driving distance of our, of where I live in our main office. And that's the very successful, that's been a very successful approach for us. And there's a lot of advantages to that, but I've kind of got all my eggs in one basket in that respect. So, um, we've begun to span, expand just a little bit geographically. Um, we've continued to push into multifamily and I've got the same concerns that a lot of investors do that are out there looking at the valuations right now. And so, um, really over the last six to eight months, we've been um, trying to get ourselves in a better position just in case something uh, doesn't go the way we hope it does. So mm-hmm. um, we've been doing some refinancings. Um, we sold, sold a few of our, our smaller properties, continue to push into multifamily. Um, it's been uh, an increasing challenge to, to grow our company at the same incredibly fast rate that we, we did all along. So um, I've actually begun to look at um, syndication as a, as a as a possible way to move forward. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's one one thing that I think sets us apart from a lot of investors out there is we've managed to grow our portfolio without raising any outside capital, mm-hmm. and we do that primarily through value add. We'll we'll increase the the income and drive those expenses down and create value, and then we can go out and refi and um, pull some cash out and, and grow. Um, but that's become that's becoming more of a challenge now. Mm-hmm. Okay, very interesting. You, you hit on a lot of different things there, and so I'm going to try to dissect the last <laughs> couple of minutes. And uh, yep. I guess first and foremost, let's talk about expanding your uh, geographical horizons. Uh, I know that um, you know you, you you had some you know I guess I wouldn't say challenges, but uh, you you were somewhat opposed to it last time we talked. You're like you really you were doing really well in your local marketplace. There seemed to be enough yeah. opportunity to keep you guys busy and to you know ultimately you know reach your your growth goals at least at that point in time. Now you're you know kind of expanding your horizons a little bit. Uh, talk to me a little bit about getting over that hump. I know a lot of people have that 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 hurdle. Uh, you know. Uh, more so a wall than anything, you know, they, sure. there's fear, there's, uh, there, there, there's lots of uh, challenges in their mind associated with buying out of area versus being able to see that property on a daily basis. I've got my kind of um, explanation behind it, but I'd love to hear it from your side, like how you ultimately made it through that hurdle and, and are getting more comfortable um, with owning outside of your immediate marketplace. Absolutely. You know, and and I can't say we've completely climbed over that wall yet. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But we've we've just had such great advantages being local. We've had we have these huge economies of scale, we're able to um, manage so many properties out of one office and share staff that even though we're not in a high growth marketplace, and it's not necessarily a marketplace that most people would get excited about, we've been able to do well. And that's part of it is being local and hands on and, and, and so recognizing the reality that, hey, you know, we've kind of maybe reached our saturation point in our own market, we've got this risk, um, we just decided that, hey, it's, it's, the, it's the right thing to do. So over the last couple of years, each property has been just, just a little bit further outside of, you know, but still, we still have all our properties within an hour's drive of our office. Mm-hmm. And we just put one under contract just within the last couple of weeks. That's a two hour drive from the office. So. Uh-oh. But as, as we move, it's very interesting because we have to reevaluate how we staff these properties, how we manage these processes. And so it's not an accident that we're doing it incrementally because it necessitates that we change our processes and how we operate on a day-to-day basis and how we staff properties. Um, so, so one you, of our you most- handle all the management in-house, just to, just to get that out there. Okay, got it. That's right. We do handle it all ourselves. Um, and, and it was, you know, Within the last few months, we picked up a 126 unit property that's just a far enough drive out away from our office that we really had to, and it was large enough, it really demanded that it be staffed on site. And so we're working through just making sure we've got these processes. And, and it's very interesting because as we look further outside of our marketplace, we realize that, hey, the, the process to manage something that's an hour away really isn't that different than if it were, say, you know, a two hour plane ride away. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, we're, you know, that's something that we're, that's underway right now. And I remain a, a huge proponent of buying locally if you can do it. I just think that you can manage so many risks that way. Um, There's so many advantages. I do cover those in my book, but just no one will ever manage your property quite the way that you would yourself. And there's no substitute for stopping by in person to see what's going yeah. on. So 
Mm -hmm. But that said, sometimes it's just not feasible. And sometimes there's other things that draw you to other markets and that, that may be much more attractive from an investment standpoint. And you just have to recognize that you're trading off there. There's, there's pros and cons and, and you're getting some advantages and some disadvantages. Got it. Got it. No, that's a great, great point. All good points. Let's talk about the, the shift that you've made uh, from, you know, maybe 50, 50 at 50% commercial real estate, which would be office and retail uh, and 50% uh, multifamily. That's what your holdings look like uh, two years ago. And you said that's more started pushing, you know, higher towards the multifamily side. So now you're maybe at like a, um, I forget what you mentioned. It may 40% um, commercial retail and 60% uh, multifamily or maybe even higher than that multifamily. Yeah. But I guess what is the, the reasoning behind that shift? And ultimately, if you're looking to, you know, maybe buy outside of your immediate marketplace in the multifamily space, are you still open to uh, and aggressively looking at, um, you know, commercial opportunities or are you just really, you like in the, uh, the residential space much better than the commercial? I think, you know, we've, we've had some, we've had experienced advantages, both with commercial and multifamily, you know, they've both, again, they've got their pros and their cons. I, I think overall, um, I've just really enjoyed doing the multifamily probably a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. I feel, um, I feel, I feel like you've got a lot more control over your income with the multifamily when you, when you're managing a commercial property, it depends on the specific property, but many, many times you have a disproportionate amount of rent coming in from individual tenants. So if you, if you lose a tenant in a commercial property, depending on the, the specific property, you may lose 10% of your rent or you may lose 100% of your rent. Yeah. Or you may lose 50% or 60%. Um, and that's, that's a challenge, never knowing when that's coming. And as, as people have seen with all the closings across, across the country, especially in retail, Sometimes you have a, a seemingly stable, solid company that's a national tenant uh, that two years later, you, you just don't know what's going to happen. Sure. And um, you don't really have a whole lot of control over that as a landlord. And when a space vacates and, and you, 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 know, you don't have that cash flow to cover your debt, you've got to carry, you got to be prepared to carry that. You can <laughs> contrast that to multifamily and, you know, you can lose one tenant and you might lose you know, a couple percent of your, of, of your rent. So. Mm -hmm. Have you had that personal experience in the, uh, the office or retail properties that you've owned to where maybe not catastrophic, like you can't service your debt, but you had an unexpected uh, departure uh, of one of the tenants that made up a disproportionate amount, you know, whether it be 10 or 20 or even higher percentage, has that occurred? And ultimately, if so, how have you handled that? It has, you know, and, and I was really fortunate that it didn't happen early on. And, and I, I try to find commercial properties that have that diversification among the, the, the rent. Um, you know, it, 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 cause it does, it does happen. It does make you nervous. So, mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of one plaza in particular where our largest tenant occupied 40% of the, of the, of the space and uh, they vacated. It took us about two years to backfill that space. And wow. A lot of times, and you know, and, and we operated at a, at a cash flow negative for that entire time. Um, a lot of times, it's not as easy with, with commercial as well to control occupancy through rent. So, what I mean by that is, with multifamily, if your occupancy is dropping, you'll often see a pretty immediate response from the market when you adjust your rents. Mm -hmm. um, when you adjust rent on a commercial space, it might not do anything at all. It really, it has other factors that play into it. It has to be the appropriate space for that business model and what, what a specific type of business is looking for. Um, and so it can be harder to backfill that space. You, yeah. and you can't just do, you know, if you throw concessions out there like you can with multifamily or you tweak your rents, you don't see as, as immediate of a response. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, great point. I, I, is it safe to assume if I had to ask you what your favorite asset class is, and I know that they all have their pros and cons, but is it multifamily? Is, is that where we're leaning at this point in time? If you had to answer that question with an absolute answer? <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> you know, and I, frankly, there's another aspect that people don't talk about too much. And it's really interesting. The people that don't have a lot of experience in the commercial space will oftentimes believe that a, a commercial tenant is easier to work with. And in my experience, I actually prefer to work with the residential tenants more than the commercial tenants, um, especially some professional tenants, um, doctors and, and attorneys. And, 
you know, at so, some of these people can be exceptionally demanding and not necessarily particularly reasonable at times. And that, that can be a challenge. And uh, with our residential tenants, we're, we have primarily uh, workforce housing type tenants and, mm-hmm. and they're people who are down to earth. And, and uh, you know, frankly, I'm, I've been more comfortable dealing with them. Got it. Got it. No, it makes sense. I, I want to talk a little bit about a project that uh, we might have touched on in the very first time uh, uh, that we interviewed you, but I don't think we went into depth. And uh, you brought you brought it back to my attention, um, uh, I guess about six or seven months ago when we met at that mastermind group. And it was about a uh, an older uh, exterior corridor hotel. I believe it was exterior corridor or was it interior? It was interior. Oh, yeah. oh it is interior. Okay. Yeah. An older yeah. uh, interior corridor hotel that you essentially purchased. Uh, and I can't remember the vacancy, you can give us all the details, but you converted it into an apartment complex. Um, So you repurposed it into a higher and better use and uh, have been doing quite well with that investment. So I'd love to, you know, that's an intriguing strategy. Um, You know, there's every single one of us listening here uh, has been, you know, has driven through a town or city, could be the place you actually live, or it could be, you know, during your travels, you, you see motels or hotels that, um, that are vacant or just, you know, not the greatest of shape. And that might be a great location, very close to the interstate. A lot of them are, um, could be in a growing area, but not necessarily a demand for whatever the type of product was that was being offered and could have a higher and better use. And so let's talk a little bit about that project, Brian, I guess, first and foremost, uh, you know, how you found it. And then, you know, what told you inside, like, Hey, this has got a higher and better use. Uh, you know, this surely would have a huge demand for, uh, as an apartment. Talk to me about that, that, that process you went through on deciding uh, and pursuing uh, that particular investment. Yeah, you know, in, in today's market, that's the exact kind of thing you've got to look for is, is ways to add value and a change in use is right up there. Um, and really, in terms of thinking back to how it caught my eye and, and what made me recognize that, it gets right back to that advantage of investing locally, because I because it was a local property and I, I knew the brokers, I knew that the property was in distress. I was familiar with the new construction that had gone in that had put this property in distress. Um, I recognized that there was a shortage in our market of studio apartments and smaller apartment options. There, there was a, a, a lot more two bedroom, three bedroom units, but I knew that there was, there was an unmet demand there for the smaller units. So it all kind of just lined up and, and, and made, it, made it look like something that, that made sense. Um, the, pro- the project was very successful for us, and I, I think we would consider doing a conversion again, but we did learn, um, we did learn a lot. And so um, probably the one thing to be aware of if you're going to go in and do a conversion like that is that you're changing the use of a property. And when you do that, that can trigger a lot of code requirements. Mm-hmm. So um, in, in our marketplace and, and in a lot of jurisdictions, that change in use would actually trigger requirements that would be the same as if you were going to construct new. Mm-hmm. So one of the things you want to look for, it's certainly much better if you have newer construction hotel that you want to convert than if it were an older property, because it's much more likely to have some of the things that, that you would require, such as a sprinkler system. Um, this particular hotel um, had had a, a large addition at, at in um, the 1990s that was sprinkler. So we did have to add sprinklers, but we only had to add it to about 30 to 40% of the building. Mm. Um, ADA requirements came in you know, we had to, and, and, and I, I hated to have to do this, but we had to tear out a lot of perfectly good bathrooms and, oh. and uh, build them from scratch so that they were compliant with current ADA standards. We even had to take out some old ADA bathrooms because the spacings weren't up to current code. Hmm. Um, so some of those, some of those things you, you want to, you know, if you're looking for a, a hotel, you want to recognize that, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be brought up to code. There's costs associated with that. Um, you don't necessarily want to find a, a, a hotel that, that has large common spaces. So we didn't have conference rooms or restaurant or anything else that was peripheral to the rooms themselves, kept our conversion costs lower, uh, very efficient. Um, you know, we, we had one small common area that we, we converted into a laundry room. We had a, an office that was, uh, being, being used by the, the prior owners that we converted into another unit. Um, and so it was a very, very efficient process. And 
we had to add kitchenettes. So certainly if you identify a, a hotel that already has the kitchenettes in place, mm-hmm. uh, that that's a huge help because uh, the plumbing is there and it's a, that can be a big cost. You've got to look at what walls have plumbing. If you do have to add a kitchenette, is that going to work out well? Um, and, and oftentimes the, the traditional layout of, of, a, of a hotel room does lend itself to adding a kitchenette. Um, and so that, you know, that's not a deal breaker if you don't have them. Mm-hmm. Very it's, interesting. The, the size is important. You'd want to check your code for your state building code in terms of the minimum square footage size for either a studio or one bedroom. If you don't meet that, you might need to combine adjacent rooms. Um, we did combine some of the rooms and, and turn them into one bedrooms where the, where the first original hotel room became the, con, the, the uh, living room area and the kitchen. Mm. And then the adjacent room became the bedroom. Did you find the ones that you combined, did you find that um, uh, you know, the demand was higher for those one bedroom units versus studio? Or, or if you can go back in time, would you just kept them all as studio units? I would have definitely preferred to keep them all. And actually the, the primary driver behind combining them was that some of the units were shy of the required minimum square wow. footage for the size. And we ended up sort of negotiating an agreement to combine a certain number of units in there to get the square footage. Got it. Got it. Very interesting. The, the rent per square foot was definitely way higher on the smaller units. And, and that's, that's generally the case. Um, for, for most multifamily properties, if you look at the, the price that people pay per square foot in the unit, in our experience, it's generally the smaller the unit, the higher the, the dollars per square foot. Mm-hmm. And there was a, a, a study done on the rents not that long ago in our marketplace. And even though this converted hotel is by no means a, a, a fancy apartment building, it actually has the highest dollar per square foot rent in, <laughs> in the entire city. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a class, you know, C, C plus property and it's getting it's getting more rent per square foot than a, than a class a um, love it class a building that's yeah. great I, I'm, a, I'm i'm assuming being that it was originally built as a hotel that you know the utilities you don't have uh individually built water and sewer individually built electricity um because it wasn't built for that particular purpose so is it just all inclusive whatever that rent is on a monthly basis that's all inclusive of uh, electricity water sewer trash everything Right now it is. Yeah. So it's, it's all inclusive. And, and that really appeals to the demographic that these type of units are, are, mm-hmm. are really going to attract. Um, you know, it's very much workforce housing. It's very much uh, people who want to rent their very first place after moving out of, you know, their home with their, with their parents or uh, getting their first jobs or, you know, um, restaurant workers and, and retail workers. Uh, it's, it's a good, it's a good fit. How do you monitor uh, abuse of utilities? I mean, I guess it, the unit's fairly small. So uh, do you have issues with like folks uh, abusing their, you know, the heating, like they got the darn windows open and it's the middle of winter and they've got the heat blasting or, you know, they, you know, they're, they're excessively using the water. Uh, I've always found that to be the challenge with different properties that we've owned over the years, whether it be apartments or uh, even in mobile home parks, when we purchase it, it's the arrangements, all the utilities, at least the water and sewers included, I've never owned anything. I don't think where the electricity was included, but I could see where abuse would come into play fairly quickly and, and ultimately have a negative impact on your, your bottom line. So how do you guys manage that? You know, I think we've just been really fortunate. We have not had any cases like that, at least not at this property. I mean, we have at others and, and generally, um, you know, we, we try to keep a close eye on things. Again, that's one of the, one of the advantages of being local. We can make sure a property gets walked every day and that there's not, you know, something at least that's obvious in terms of abuse. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, oftentimes it it ends up showing up on a bill or something that a lot of times elapsed until it can be addressed. And, and, uh, you know, but I, I think that happens, that can happen just about anywhere. So Yeah, yeah, got it. You know, after Brian, Brian and I spoke about this particular um, uh, pr- uh, project uh, a little bit more in depth uh, at the Mastermind we had a few months back, and I got the researching just to see, like, you know, h- how much information was out there on this, you know, th- this strategic, I guess, process of repurposing older motels and hotels into uh, apartment properties. And there ha- just happens to be, there's a gentleman or a company, I guess you could say, um, 
here in the Tampa Bay area that uh, he's got a number of uh, units and most of the ones that he converted were older like motel type properties. So even an older vintage than, uh, than, than, you know, the interior corridor that, that Brian had converted. Um, he had converted, I think, uh, 10 or more in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, and then also he went to Orlando, which was about an hour and a half away. I think maybe about 20 or 30 properties in total, but that, that's, that's his wow. niche. That, that's who he services is, uh, um, you know, you know, that, that, that class of folks that, that they're looking for studio apartments or looking for affordable option. Um, a little easier if it's all inclusive of all the utilities being there. And, uh, uh, I'm not sure if he does well or not. I'm assuming that it has to make sense if he uh, if he keeps redeveloping these things. And uh, they're not in the best parts of town, but most of them, it seems that they're on the, the edge of progress. Uh, I know the Tampa Bay market really well, and most of the things that he owns are areas that probably are a little sketchy today, but ultimately the uh, you know the, the growth is pushing in that direction and, and will be there in maybe five to seven years. So he's like right on the outskirts of it. And you know, for him, it could be a covered land play to where his, his piece of property is worth much more uh, five, seven, or 10 years from now. Um, and, and during that period of time, up until then, he's just gonna, he's gonna cash flow. He's got a good um, cash flowing investment property. So uh, we all know that affordable housing is in major demand here in this country. And those types of projects are, are in high demand. And so I just, if you guys have an interest in this conversion process, do yourself a favor, go Google it. I mean, you'll find, I found multiple articles of folks that have successfully done this uh, across the country, just like Brian has. And uh, it could be another opportunity for you. But as Brian had mentioned in the beginning, it's just really all about keeping your eyes open, trying to see an opportunity where the majority don't, right? You know, most other people would just probably have driven past that that hotel that Brian bought and probably driven past it a ton of different times, probably some very successful real estate entrepreneurs there locally developers that just continue to drive past it. Brian saw something that everyone else didn't, right? Like how can you remove yourself from your own body and, and really try to take a completely different perspective and, and see where there might be a problem that you ultimately can come up with a solution for. So um, no, I, I, I appreciate you sharing all the details, Brian, with us about that. I think that it's uh, it was an exciting project. Obviously you haven't done any other since then, but would, let me ask you this, if the right opportunity came along, would you be opposed to, based on all the challenges that you face, if you've learned a lot, you wouldn't make a lot of the same mistakes again, uh, would you take on another conversion project like that one if the uh, opportunity presented itself? We absolutely would. Um, and in fact, I came very close to pulling the trigger on another one um, not that long ago. Um, especially because now, and, and I shared with your listeners a lot of the things you want to look for that would indicate that, you know, it, what might make a nice candidate. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's opportunities to do this all across the country. I'm shocked that it hasn't happened more. Cap rates are so much higher on hotels right now than they are on multifamily that I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity out there that, that people can pursue. Just keep in mind, you, you want to, you want to, you know, check into the, the code requirements in, in your, your local area. And remember that you're going to have to go through a lease up. So you're going to have to carry that property for a while. It's almost in that respect, it's almost like new construction. Um, you know, at the end of your conversion, you're going to have a big empty apartment building. <laughs> I'll just say, do you think, so, is there an opportunity maybe uh, uh, to where you can get like a variance, like literally, you know, so operate half of it as a hotel and, you know, convert the other half, you'll get the change of use on half of it. That'd be interesting to see if uh, you could approach it from that angle. Probably not. I'm, I'm probably uh, stretching <laughs> that one, but <laughs> that, that way you can yeah. maintain some revenues while you're doing the conversion. Cause you're right. I mean, having a completely vacant building um, uh, on your hands yeah. and then, you know, dumping a bunch of money into it to make it habitable for this new use. Yeah. Uh, that's tough. I mean, just the, right. carrying, the carrying costs alone, if you don't, uh, if you don't, um, you know, uh, I guess budget accordingly, it could eat you alive, literally eat you alive and, uh, and, and essentially take your business and put it out of business faster than you could ever, you know, yeah. Than yeah. You, <laughs> <in business. laughs> yeah. Yeah. You want to, you definitely want to plan accordingly. You know, it, yeah. the one that we looked at closely, um, one of the appealing things about it is, is some of the tenants that were, some of the, the people who were staying in the hotel were, were staying long term, And, uh, mm. So I, I, you know, I, I felt like they were sort of doing an end around on the requirements for, for hotel stays, but you know, the, the owner indicated that a lot of them he felt like would, would rent from us and stay. Um, so that, that was, you know, because he was renting them out as more extended stay and some of them had apparently been there for quite some time. So you know, it's all, there's always opportunities. You, you can't ever make, you know, assumptions and, and um, you just got to dig into these things and figure out where your opportunities are. 
Wouldn't there have been an opportunity on this specific deal just to keep it as an extended stay? And then that, that way you, you're basically running it like an apartment. If you want to market it that way, you're running it like an apartment. It's maybe week by week tenancy. Um, but then you ultimately retain some additional controls that you might not, you know, assuming like an annual lease arrangement. I mean, it was, was that not an option that you explored? Well, you know, the way he was operating it, I don't think was compliant with code. Right. Yeah. So you're kind of opening yeah. yourself up to get a, to get cracked down on. I, don't, I think the, in most places you're not supposed to let them stay more than 30 days. Okay. Um, so, and, and frankly, I, I could run it sort of like an apartment complex, but I'd still be changing our business model to some extent. And, and yeah. um, you know, I'm, I'm, I try not to chase out too many shiny objects. I do enough of that. So. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, that's one of the other questions I want to get out of the way before we uh, uh, before we finish up the show here is, you know that that I, I preach about like focus on, you know, mastering one asset class. Not not saying that you can't go invest in other types of real estate, but you know, focus on one, become an expert at it, prove that concept, and then once you've you know uh, built a business out of that one focus, you know, then maybe you can pull in another one, right? Maybe I, we we own mobile home parks today. Maybe you know, if I like, I wouldn't say we're on autopilot, but um, I feel as though we would be quite successful if we said, hey, we want to introduce mobile uh, or uh, self storage to, um, uh, to to our portfolio or apartment complexes. I've owned lots of different types of real estate, and so I get all those different assets classes but uh, the first like year or two of us buying mobile home parks it would not have made any sense whatsoever for us to be buying uh, different types of uh, of real estate uh, and we need to keep our focus there so we could prove that concept and really master it you know there's lots of learning challenges that exist when you dive into any any different asset class and so maybe speak to us a little bit about um, how you've been able to to manage that that growth period over these last uh, um, what is it 12 years and and not feel like you're getting pulled in too many directions because 50,000 square foot office in the first deal uh, and sure, then whatever came sure. after that, but you had retail, yeah. you had office and a bunch of multifamily. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, there's, there are certainly differences and that I can't argue with that. Um, but you know what? There's so many more similarities. And uh -huh. so I think that um, can't argue with the fact that there, there's benefits to staying focused. There, there are fewer things to learn. You're, you're likely to make fewer mistakes and, and I've, you know, I've certainly made my share, but um, you know, even to this day, we have a lot of staff that work. They're not dedicated to specifically multifamily or retail or office. Um, they're really operated in a, in a very similar way. So um, I think that in some ways it's been beneficial because we've got those shared resources. And also mm -hmm. occasionally we, we, we learn something in one asset class that we realize, Hey, why, why isn't that employed over here in this other asset class? Yeah. Um, and it can lead to some innovation. Um, at the same time, if you want to be really efficient and scale, um, then it becomes a hindrance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we were looking at is I, I really, I wanted to focus on our local market. I wanted to be opportunistic. And when a great deal came along and I, and I had an opportunity to add a lot of value to a property, I was open to any asset class to do mm -hmm. that. And um, now that we're, we've grown quite a bit and we're looking to take things to the next level, I realized, hey, that's, that's a challenge. I mean, pe people have done that, but they're, you know, if, if, especially as we, grow geographically, I think it's going to be a, a lot easier to, to focus on that one asset class. And that's why we're, we're doing that and, and, and excited to take it to the next level with the multifamily. Yeah. Great. Great. I appreciate all that. Now, great information there, Brian. And, you know, every time we have you to show, it's been the second time we'll, we'll have a third, we'll have a fourth, we'll have a fifth, but every time you come on, every time I'm around you, I get a lot of great information, lots of great ideas. Uh, um, you've obviously been incredibly successful over these last 12 years and, um, and, 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 you know, you're continuing to you know, push your company forward and seeing lots of, lots of growth and lots of success along the way. And so kudos to you and, and, and everyone in your organization, cause I know it's not a one man band. You've got a team behind you that helps make this happen. And, uh, um, with that being said, lots of great information you shared, but if, if you had just one last, I like to call it the golden nugget, right? If you had just one last final golden nugget of advice or wisdom that you could leave with our listeners that, uh, might inspire and motivate them as they progress in their commercial real estate investing career. What, what would that one last golden nugget be? If I had to pick the, the one sort of, I guess, strategy that's led to our greatest success, it's really a focus on the value add. And so um, I would encourage your listeners to get out there and, and look for ways to add value. 
but to not go overboard with that because things have really changed. You know, it wasn't that long ago that people didn't pay for that value add. You paid for what was there. Mm -hmm. And that's sound investing advice to this day. People are, are now rationalizing higher prices by identifying all the value add ahead of time and paying for it up front. Um, I would say they need to make sure that their properties are going to cash flow and um, that if the, if the market turn, does turn south on them, if their properties are cash flowing and they can cover their debt, they're going to be fine. It doesn't matter if the, uh, if the cap rates change, if they can, if they can you know, weather the storm with, with the cash flow. But mm -hmm. um, go out there, look for ways to add value. Don't overpay. Um, but, um, you know, you can't, it's never going to be the perfect time either. So yeah. uh, don't be shy and, and get out there and get started. No, that's great advice. And just one more point I'd add there, you know, regarding value add, a lot of times uh, if you're getting into a value add project, uh, you know, Brian had mentioned, like, just make sure that, you know, it can, it can support and service the debt. Um, so that you can, you can carry you through the downturn. Who cares if the cap rates go up and, and your property gets devalued a little bit, as long as it's still cash flowing and you can service the debt. The challenge that, that I'm starting to see, kind of, we'll see how it plays out in the coming years, is folks really get into things you know, that are value add. They're paying for uh, some or a lot of that upside. They're getting more so bridge debt put in place on the front end. Um, not necessarily cash flow. It wouldn't cash flow today with a normal loan in place. Uh, and you know, they got to be able to achieve the substantial upside uh, value in a short period of time. And what happens if, uh, whether it's a bridge loan or even like a, um, you know, a local or regional uh, type of bank debt that's got a five-year balloon, but what happens uh, if, if you can't fully execute net plan or if there's a slight bump in the market, uh, a downturn in the market before you can get that new longer, whether it's Fannie debt or Freddie debt or CMBS debt put in place, uh, what is your plan B? And, and I'm, I'm, Unfortunately, I think we're going to see some of that play out in the coming years because uh, a lot of folks are stretching, really, really stretching. And they're, uh, they're, they're, they're buying things on tomorrow's value and the debt they're putting in place isn't the best debt to help you actually uh, weather that downturn. So I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, that Brian, but um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. I, I'm truly not a, a magician and I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, I'm watching things get sold in our in our space you know in the mobile home park space that i literally can't make sense of at all and i feel like i know the niche pretty well but uh yeah. there's always smarter people than us that's what i like <laughs> to say <laughs> yeah no it's there's definitely i think people are wise to use caution right now um yeah. as we've looked at possibly syndicating some deals and i've been looking at things uh, at other regions of the country as well and you know it's a very very frothy market right now and, mm -hmm. and uh People are paying for all that value add up front and they're not leaving themselves any room. And if you have exposure and your rates are going to reset for some reason because of your finance financing structure, like you mentioned, um, you know, that, that, that could, you know, there's going to be some, some prices to pay if, uh, you know, if that ever, if that uh, worst case scenario ever plays out. So um, that said, we can still find great deals and people just need to be persistent. You know, the change of use we talked about today is a, is a great example. And, and, uh, but if, you know, there's no substitute for rolling up your sleeves and, and yeah. working hard to find those deals and, uh, and be patient and they'll come. Yeah, you work, absolutely. You work hard enough, they're there. I agree. I agree. You got you to put in the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the sweat equity, they say, you know, but, you know put, put your work in and, um, you know, uh, I feel like today you have to hustle a little harder, but that's okay. What I like to say is that if you can get very good uh, and hustle at, at finding, uncovering opportunities and identifying opportunities where others don't in, in, in a uh, more aggressive buyer's market like we're in today, then if things do take a shift uh, to where it becomes more of a seller's market, then you should be able to clean up shop. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so with that being said, Brian, really appreciate you coming back on. It's always a pleasure to, to talk with you. Uh, folks, if you'd like to learn more about Brian and his company, you can go visit his website at washingtonstreetproperties.com. Again, washingtonstreetproperties.com. And Brian, that's all we have, my friend. Uh, always a pleasure having you on and look forward to, to staying in touch with you. Thanks so much, Kevin. I appreciate it.